Occasionally I get reminded by folks that they're not quite as good at playing Name That Tune. So in case you want to figure that one out, that was My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. If you have a hymnal at home, you can look it up. You can always look it up online. And by the way, if you don't have a hymnal at home and would like one, we actually have some we can provide for you. So just send us an, drop me an email and we'll work that out in the coming days for you as a, a way of ongoing encouragement. All right. A good morning to you again. And uh, we're going to pick up today in our study of the book uh, of Colossians, the letter of Paul to the Christians uh, in Colossae. Last week we spent a good deal of time with a very thorough introduction uh, for this multi-week study that we're going to be in this fall. So I hope that was helpful to you. If you need to see it or hear it, you can go back and find that on our website, access it and listen to it. Today we're going to dive right in. So I hope you have your Bible open to Colossians chapter 1. It might be a physical copy like this. You might be like Jonathan and using your telephone. Pastor Larry over here likes to use his telephone. The U version is available for free. You hear, you hear us refer to that and has access to our notes page as well. So strongly encourage you to make good use of it, whether it's physical or digital digital. Keep it open to this first chapter of Colossians for the rest of the morning. And just a reminder, this is a relatively short book. It will greatly bless and benefit you to read it through several times uh, over the course of this study so that it soaks in good. I strongly encourage you to do that. So as you have it open, we look over these opening verses. When you start the, the letter to the Colossians, it, it doesn't come across as anything particularly remarkable right off the bat, like many of uh, those letters. It starts quite simply. We're going to look at that in just a moment. What you typically find is who the letter's from. It's going to mention Paul and Timothy, the group to whom the letter is sent, the Colossian Christians, and some warm personal greetings, a, a quick word of, of personal encouragement. We spent a good bit of time last week on both the sender and the recipients, uh, Paul and the Colossians, so I'm not going to repeat all of that today, but just uh, to make sure we avoid being criticized as being simple-minded, uh, non-scholarly, that somehow we don't uh, take the Bible uh, as rigorously in our study as we, as we would perhaps some other things in certain kinds of schools. Uh, let me address a couple things just quickly here kind of as reminders, some a little more in-depth than last week. It is true, if you're a study of the Bible, one of the critiques they will often have is try to figure out who the author is. There are some books like Hebrews, for example, that don't name the author. There are others that claim to be by somebody and some people who uh, criticize the Bible, who analyze the Bible, say, well, I'm not really sure they wrote that. And so it is true that when you look at Colossians, there are some scholars who have some questions about whether Paul is the author. They'll point to a few facts and they'll say something like this. They'll say, well, the style of the Greek that is used, the way somebody speaks. And if you've noticed, Jonathan and I speak differently when we use uh, English. It's a generational thing. Uh, there are others that just have a different way, depending on their schooling, their approach, where they grew up regionally in our country. And so it's true that the Greek is a little bit different than those than the Greek that is used in certain letters that we are for sure were written by Paul, Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, to name a few. Uh, in addition uh, to the Greek sentence style, the Greek way that it's written, another reason people say, well, I'm not sure Paul wrote this, is that he doesn't use all of the same theological language, the vocabulary that he's famous for in some of those other books. He doesn't use the word righteousness or justification that he uses in so many of his other letters. And some people say, oh, that, that's inconsistent with how Paul would write. But the fact is that that Paul in many of those other letters is writing about how we live as Christians in light uh, of the coming uh, of the end of the world. And in this letter, it's really focused on living uh, in the, with the purpose and the meaning in our lives that comes from being in Him, as Jonathan pointed out, that preposition, in Christ, in this present world 
What does it mean to live in Him who is so supreme? Because the book of Colossians is about this colossal Christ, this great one who is so far above us. So it's true that these differences exist, and it could be because there's a different author. Those who like to doubt the Bible, that's what they'll say. Uh, I might also just put forward this simple solution. Uh, It could be that the same author is writing to people about different topics in a different city with different problems. And that pretty much, and he uses perhaps a different secretary, what is referred to in the Greek language as an amenuensis. We know that Paul was uh, greatly damaged in his eyesight. Uh, And so he would often sign the very end of a letter, but he didn't write the whole thing. And so as Paul was uh, telling them how to write, often there'll be some slight differences because of the secretary that he used. So I just want to say, look, I I believe this is written by Paul very clearly, with all due respect to the scholars and the skeptics who think otherwise, because there are so many similarities between Colossians and Paul's other letters. Paul opens it just like he opens his other letters. He says, hey, it's me, Paul. And Apostle Christ, he talks about who else is with him. Hey, it's me and Timothy again, uh, writing out to you. That's very, very similar to how he opens. And here's another very powerful fact for me. Although the sentence structure varies a little bit, the vocabulary differs a little bit because he's talking about a different subject, the fact is the structure of the letter as a whole is exactly how Paul writes so many of his letters. He, he opens up with uh, this greeting and then a brief opening, usually with some personal little comments to start up. Then there's a theological idea section. Next week, Pastor Paula will be bringing a message on the supremacy of Christ in the second half of chapter 1, and it's one of the most magnificent passages about Jesus in the entire Bible. That's a big theological idea. You know what comes after that? A discussion about how we live because of this great Christ, how our lives are changed. That's exactly how Paul writes in most of his other books. He casts great spiritual theological vision, and then he writes about the consequences. If you believe these things to be true, and they are, he says, then one should live like this. And so that's very consistent between Colossians and all of the other things uh, that he writes. And another piece that I would just say to you is if you look throughout Paul's letters and you get to know the people who hang out with Paul, the people that he specifically mentions by name as being with him or often sometimes delivering his letters or sometimes being particular key individuals in those local congregations to whom he writes, you'll see that those same suspects show up. The ones in the letter to Philemon, which is written at the same time as the letter of Colossians, refers to the same people, Timothy, Epaphras, Onesimus, Aristarchus, Mark, and Luke. And so I think uh, it's very, very clear that it's Paul who's writing. He's writing from prison, as we have noted before. And so I I think as he opens this letter, he says, look, Paul and Timothy, we're writing to you. And then we move into verse 2. Now look at verse 2 for a second. And, and, And some people, when they look at this and they see, okay, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae. You know, there are organizations, Christian groups that have a strict little list of things you have to do to be classified as a saint. Well, you have to do this thing and this thing and this thing and this thing. And if you hit enough of them over time, then eventually you are declared a saint. But according to the Bible, according to the Bible, becoming a saint is an instantaneous thing when a repentant sinner turns from their wicked ways, abandons all hope of being saved by their own efforts, and places their faith in the work of the great Jesus Christ, the unstained Lamb of God, the perfect one. And they put their faith in Him and what He has done on their behalf, and they are made and declared saints. According to Paul and according to the Bible, all true followers of Christ are indeed saints. Why? Because we're perfect? No, because He is perfect and we are, what did Jonathan remind us of? In Him. And so that is Paul's point as even as he begins right off the bat. These people are in Christ and they have been set apart as holy unto God. And look at what else Paul says about those ones that are here at Colossae. He says, your faithful brethren. 
Wow, that's a great testimony right off the bat. Don't you, don't you wish people would always say that about you, about us? These folks are in a city. We talked about it's a crossroad city, all kinds of ideas coming through, all kinds of false doctrines, all kinds of struggles, people who didn't like Christians, people who didn't like them. They were persecuted, but they remained faithful. They're getting hit from all sides, and he says, you are the faithful brethren, the brothers and sisters who are remaining faithful. That's a great testimony for any church in any age. We should be praying that this is how God and others see the Pathways Church is that they're the faithful brethren. They may not be perfect over there. They're following Christ. They're being faithful brethren. And then in verses 3 through 8, Paul's going to go on and he's going to lavish praise on them. We're going to circle back to this in a minute. We did talk about the fact last week, even if he's going to lavish praise on them in verses 3 through 8, we talked about the fact that he knew they weren't a perfect church. He addresses some of their shortcomings. There is no such thing as a perfect church. Ours certainly is not one. All churches have shortcomings. He will also chide the Colossians a bit for some who have fallen prey to the false teachers who are speculating about all these wild religious ideas and the worship of other heavenly beings like angels and, and powers that are out there. And Paul is writing to counter the empty deceit. That's what he calls it in chapter 2, verse 8. And he tries to counter all of that with this view of a world and a faith walk for his people that is centered on the supremacy of Christ over all things, over all people, what God has done in and through Jesus Christ on our behalf. So that's where we're going content-wise in chapter 1. Let me just remind you before we kind of circle back and restart with, with verse 1 again, just the setting. Colossae is located on a part of the Meander River. It's about 12 miles above Laodicea. It was near a major highway from Ephesus to the Euphrates. It was a city of some, not a lot. It was not a giant city, and it did not have a great commercial importance, but it had some particular things that they produced there. It was not like Corinth. It was not like Rome. It was not like Ephesus. It was not a major city on the sea. It was not like that at all. It was a small city. As a matter of fact, if you wonder why we don't go there today and see a, a lot of Colossians, it's because shortly after this book was written, there was an earthquake, and the city was essentially destroyed and never really rebuilt. And so you don't see a lot about it moving forward. It's interesting. Why that would be true, I don't know. You know, why in the providence of God this letter goes to these people. What I can tell you is what he had to say to these people in this time remains important for the people of God, not only of pathways, but around the world today. So God in his sovereignty has preserved this for us, I think in part to remind us of this. It's not the size of the city that's important. Occasionally, we get a little carried away living here in Washington, D.C., don't we? we? We think it's the, the, the center of the world. And there is a lot of political power. There's a lot of influence. There's a lot of economic influence. Uh, but the fact is, it's not the size of the city that's, that's really ever all that important. It's that always God's people who are in whatever city they are in, so wherever you are today, wherever you're watching from, whatever city you're a part of, we need to understand the greatness, the supremacy, the overarchingness of Jesus Christ. And the fact that God, as great as He is demonstrated through Christ, has a clear and simple calling and plan for his people, for the church of Jesus Christ. And as God's people fulfilling God's plan, we, we might be able to see all these complexities. Maybe, maybe you're one of those folks, you're reading all kinds of really in-depth and, 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 and complex theological books, and, and you're, you, you love Dallas Willard, and you, you, know, you, you love to get into the deep thoughts, and you say that's out, and certainly that's possible. But it's also important that we take note of some very simply stated pieces that when taken together give us a full and profound portrait of who Christ is 
and what his plan for us is. And so if you have your Bible open and you look at chapter 1, verse 1, and you see what Paul says, he says, this is from Paul and Timothy, verse 2, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, and then he speaks these words, grace to you and peace from God our Father. You see, these are standard words that Paul uses for the congregations he writes to, but I, I'm thinking here we are a couple thousand years later in the time of COVID, and what do the people of our world need as much as anything they've ever needed? They need grace. And they need peace. Grace and peace to you. Whatever city you're in, whatever time you're in, whatever era you are in, whatever sense of loss you are experiencing, whatever sense of joy and success you are finding, grace and peace to you from God the Father. Which brings us, if you're a note taker, if you're using our sheet today, viewpoint one, Paul expresses a very simple truth, the simple truth that it's always helpful to remember who we are. So Paul, when he says, I'm writing to the saints and the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, <laughs> that's a reminder of who we are. My mother told me once, she said, son, you'll never remember anything more important than who you are and whose you are. And so when we are sitting in traffic, when we're in an argument with our spouse or our significant other, uh, when we are coping with the complexities of our jobs, when we are stressed out by COVID requirements, when we are tired of wearing masks, when we are tired of not going to restaurants, when we feel the loss of a favorite Supreme Court justice, God bless Ruth Bader Ginsburg this morning, the people who serve our country, right? Men and women around the world serving it. We, we, when we are struggling with all these things, when we think about uh, being homebound for months, most of us never thought that would happen. We've now passed the six-month mark of this pandemic. When we're going through a national crisis and when we are facing a contentious national election, you know what we need to remember? Who we are and whose we are. We are the saints of Jesus Christ. We are the faithful brothers and sisters called to walk with each other with him. And unbelievable as it is, I'm looking around the room at some of you who know me well, and I know some of you pretty doggone well, and we are saints, can you believe it? And by the miracle and grace of God, we are saints. And although we tend to dwell on the moments when we turn unfaithful, we are reminded that God is gracious and we're called to be a part of his faithful people. We are set apart as saints. We have a particular purpose. We're called to be true to our position. And what is our position? You're going to get used to this over the next seven or eight weeks, right? Our position, using that preposition in, we are in Him. We are in Christ. That's what he says. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ. Today for us in the greater Washington area, but also for those who are watching, as Jonathan reminded us, we have brothers and sisters who, who watch from around the world. We're called to be saints, called to be faithful, and to receive the blessing that Paul extends, grace and peace from God who is our Father. What more can we ask than grace and peace which come to us naturally from God as a part of His simple plan for our lives. And then Paul moves on to discuss what I've referred to simply as viewpoint number two. It's another simple truth, the simple truth that it's not just who we are, but what we have received. What we have is faith, love, and hope. Now, some of you are used to the 1 Corinthians 
order, faith, hope, and love. In this particular case, Paul mentions the same characteristics, but in a different order. He talks about faith and love and hope in verses 3 through 8. He said, we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Faith, love, and hope. Let's talk about these three for just a moment. Who do they have faith in? We've heard about your faith in Christ Jesus. This is one of those situations where the, the faith is kind of function as both a noun and a verb. You have the faith in Christ Jesus, the, the body of truth. You need to understand who He is, your Savior, your Deliverer. He's going to spend the next 15 or the next 10 verses after this, verses 15 through 23 in particular, of uh, just focused on the greatness of Christ. And like I said, that'll be Paula's uh, exercise next week with you. But he is talking about the faith, the body of truth, what you believe about this one Jesus, God made flesh, the second person of the Trinity come to earth for us, and they exercise their faith, their trust, their belief in Jesus Christ as the one alone who is worthy and faithful. And so, trusting in Him, I have heard of your faith in Christ. We practice our faith in Him. It's almost like doing one of those dives back into your overstuffed chair at home, right? At the end of the day, when you just say, I am worn out, I'm done, and you just kind of flop back. I know your mother always said, what are you doing flopping around? But there are those days, right, you just want to flop back into that big overstuffed chair or onto your sofa, whatever it might be. And faith, when you're done wrestling on your own and trying to provide it yourself, and you say, you know what, it's not about me. My faith is in Christ. I'm going to relax and be in Him that's a part of what Paul is saying. He's saying, look, you'll find refreshment when your faith is in Him. A recognition of who you are, yes, but also what you have. You have faith in Christ. And then he mentions their love. He says, uh, it's well known in the region. It, it's a love you have for all the saints, for one another. It's a love they have in the Spirit, he says. Your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints. So you get the sense that the that Christ who has brought them together in the body by the Holy Spirit is, is guiding them. Verse 8, he mentions, he's informed us of your love in the Spirit. That's where we get the power to love one another, the calling to love one another. In spite, listen, I know that there are days we say, as Christians… We need to stand up for this, righteousness. As Christians, we need to stand up for equality for all people, and indeed we do. As Christians, we need to stand up for what's right, we indeed, we do. For morality and against immorality, indeed we do. But we should never forget Jesus' clear words, they'll know you are my disciples in that you have love one for another. It is the signal that Jesus is at work amongst us, within us. Uh, uh, brothers and sisters, regardless of everything else, Jesus identified love as the most important and winsome mark of his followers. And then thirdly, he talks about hope. And he, he goes on to say, look, this, this hope that, that you have, the hope laid up for you in heaven of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you just as in all the world. Also, it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing. So he said, this word, this hope is going forth. It's making a difference, the word of God, about the hope that is ours in Christ. Not just the right now but the world that is to come. It's a different mindset than saying, I need to grab all I can, eat, drink, and be merry in this moment. Just live for today. 
an obsession with possessions, afflicted with affluence, fighting the different fear factors, going for extreme makeovers, or trying not to get fired and kicked out of the boardroom, all those different things. God's hopeful people, yes, they are in the world. Those prepositions again, right? They are in the world, but they are not of the world. And their behavior anchored in this hope of heaven, empowered by the characteristics of faith and love. It's not a vague, listen folks, when he talks about this kind of hope, it's not a vague cheerleader hope. We're going to get better, rah, rah. We're going to win. We're number one. Don't worry, be happy, all those things. No, this is a hope that we have that empowers our life, our faith, and our love, and it is empowered by them, but it's based on heaven itself, the promised future that God has for us of life in the kingdom of heaven. I want to talk about that for a minute because when we focus on our practical living as Christians, we don't always talk about heaven enough. And last Saturday, our elders gathered together in person, all together, socially distanced, all masked up, but all together. It was a beautiful occasion. And in true elder fashion, we spent most of our first hour, and this won't surprise you, we had allotted 20 minutes and it took about an hour, uh, to, to just share with each other uh, what we called lessons from the pandemic. What's the most important thing as a follower of Christ, the most surprising thing that you've learned over these last six months? And we were particularly moved uh, when Pastor uh, Larry uh, retired, but still an elder in our church and a great pastor of the Word of God, he shared a testimony of what God had done in his life. And so I asked him just to come and share with us today his lesson from the pandemic on hope. So, Brother Larry, it's all yours. Last year, the best book that I read was entitled, Imagine Heaven. This year, it became clear why I so needed that book in my life. It started at the end of December. A long-anticipated trip to Hawaii became abruptly uh, aborted uh, with a bout of kidney stones. You bet I was disappointed. But I kept thinking, I've got something better than Hawaii to look forward to. I have heaven. And then came the corona pandemic. I read how Martin Luther refused to run from the plague, but stayed to help the suffering when others were naturally terrified. I saw the pandemic as a golden opportunity to rise out of the turmoil and shine brightly. I knew all along that if something deadly should happen to me, I still have heaven. Some people say that it's possible to be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. I would say the certainty and assurance of heaven sets us free to take on a world full of the very dread of death. Hebrews 2, we read, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity by his death that he might break the power of him who hold the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. So this has been a season of living and serving the joy of the freedom that Jesus has given even in the face of a pandemic. And Larry is far too gracious and humble to do a commercial, but those of us who know of his ministry 
I know that even as he reached retirement from mom as the executive director and put in his uh, notice to the, to the organization, he has continued to faithfully serve and to lead that organization in a time where many people are afraid to go out. They're going out and serving the needs of the poor and the underserved uh, of our community. And we are proud to be partners with Mid-County United Ministries and the work that they have done. So thank you, Larry, for opening that door of partnership for us. We are proud of you guys, grateful for the ministry you have done in Jesus' name uh, in this very difficult time. So we're appreciative, Larry. Thank you so much. And before we move on from this discussion uh, about the hope of heaven, uh, of course, I continue to think about this all week, and uh, I just want to touch on something I, I know Pastor Larry's heard, I've heard all of us who perform the ministerial functions of funerals and memorial services have heard many times, sometimes in hospitals as we've been with people who know they are nearing the end of this physical life. Sometimes it's people who are not particularly closely connected to Jesus, Sometimes it's churchgoers who have heard an awful lot, but who have still not perhaps understood the gospel clearly. And nothing breaks my heart than to hear them say something like this. They, they will try to say something hopeful. They want to demonstrate their hope in the face of, of coming death, but they'll say something like this. Well, you know, Pastor, I've done my best. And I just hope the man upstairs decides to let me in. And when I hear that, I am so grieved. I don't, I don't get into theological arguments. I've been better trained than that. It's not a time to give big lectures, but I try to point them to the… It's not about having done your best effort and hoping that the man upstairs will let you in. It's about the grace of God, the biblical hope of heaven. And I don't mean any insult to anyone here. But when we say it's about our best and we hope someone will let us in, that's not biblical hope. That's a worldly hope that's based on the uncertainty that is caused by basing something on our human works, on our human efforts. And it is completely removed from what biblical hope is. It is the opposite of the hope that Paul is speaking about with the Colossians and which all true Christians should have. Biblical hope provides complete assurance. It is a confident expectation of that which is still to come, not because of my merit, but, but because of the grace of God. It is the hope, the Bible says, that is laid up for us in heaven based on a true understanding of the grace of God. That was an anchor for Paul. It was an anchor for the Colossian church. And instead of making them lazy, saying, well, heaven's assured, I have nothing to do, it led them to greater faith in God and a greater expression of love for those who shared the faith in their church family, in, in their city, as they ministered in God's name. That's what biblical hope is about. The grace of God assuring us with complete certainty of what is still yet to come. Okay, again, if you're a note taker and you're using our note sheet today, let's move to viewpoint three. Because we're talking about God really, Paul is writing about a, a colossal God in this book of the Bible, but he keeps God's simple plan right in front of, front of us. And the third viewpoint is simply this, that Paul shares the simple truth of praying for what God wants for us. I wrestle with this a bit. We often talk in the office, Paul, Pastor Paula in particular has a phrase she reminds us of, uh, it, you can't want more for people than they want for themselves. In other words, you can't make people want something. It's just like motivation. We, off, we used to talk about how do you motivate people, and, and really the current theory is there is no, all motivation is self-motivation. You can paint a picture of a desirable future. You can encourage people along their journey, but they have to want it themselves. And so, and this is a bit of a stretch. This is, you know what, when you see what God wants for us, 
that calls us to want for more. And Paul does this in his prayer for those who are saints, he says, and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. When you look at verses 3 through 8, he goes on, he says, I'm praying this for you. And if you've got your Bible open, I want, look down at your Bible. Don't look at me. Look at your Bible right now. And you'll look at these phrases there. This, when he says you've got faith, hope, and love, he's praying for you. Look at this list of blessings he's praying for them. He's wanting what God wants for them. Be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Wow. Have you prayed that lately for your children? We say, you know, I pray for my children. What do you pray for your children? What do you pray for you? I pray for you, the other members of my Sunday school class. What do you pray for them? Here's where we start. Be filled with the knowledge of God's will. And then he says, I'm praying that you'll have that knowledge of the will of God in all spiritual wisdom and understanding as opposed to secular worldly wisdom. So you might say, well, I'm praying God's blessings for you. And, and see, worldly wisdom says, oh, you're praying for riches and wealth and health and those things for me. No, I, I, I'm praying that you'll understand in all spiritual wisdom and understanding that he became poor for our sakes. Maybe that's what he's calling us to. Those are what spiritual blessings are, all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And then why? He says, I want you to have this wisdom. Why? In order to lead lives worthy of the Lord, he says. Then he says, we're to live a life fully pleasing to him. Look at that next verse. Bear fruit in every good work. Are we praying this for one another? This is what we need to be praying for one another, brothers and sisters. This is what Paul is praying for the Colossians. He said, he said, you've got faith and you've got love and you've got hope. And these are the things I'm praying for you, the blessings that result from all that kind of a life, bear fruit in every good work. And then he says, be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power. Man, don't you love when somebody prays, Larry, I'm praying for you that you be made strong in the strength that comes from His glorious power, not that you'll just be really, really good for a guy your age or that you might have the strength of a guy half your age, but that you would have the strength that comes from His glorious power. Are we praying that way for one another? Prepared to endure everything with patience. Oh, my can we just say that phrase right there is the sermon for the coronavirus era? Prepared, oh, wearing a mask is too much trouble. Really? You don't care enough about me to wear a mask? It's about each other. It's not just about us, folks. Be prepared to endure everything with patience. And he doesn't just say endure it with a grumpy spirit. He says joyfully give thanks to the Father. Recognize that God has rescued us from the power of darkness. Recognize Jesus as the one in whom we, in whom, we saw that verse with Jonathan earlier today, right? In whom or in him, right? We have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And if you have the notes that we've provided, you see I've summed these things up. In other words, Paul says, I'm praying for you to have knowledge, wisdom, right living, good works, strength, endurance with patience, thanksgiving, enlightenment, and forgiveness. I mean, those nine things, we could have a nine-point sermon today and just go on forever. I'm not going to do that to you, but I am leaving. I gave you that list because if you say, I want to be a student of the Word of God, go study those things. That's what God wants for you. Become motivated in your own personal life to say, I want what God wants for me. It's not about pleasing Pastor Eddie. It's not about checking a box off. It's about what does God want for me? Paul is praying these blessings. And what does God want for your family? What does God want for your friends? Folks, we can help each other. We can bless each other by praying for these things in each other's lives, claiming these blessings for one another. And I understand there's no denying that outside forces and pressures continually conspire to afflict us with pressures, temptation, distraction, stress, 
enormous. Again, in this time of coronavirus, we're very aware of most of those things. Nobody would deny that. We go through struggles of compassion fatigue, and we want instant change. We want upgrades for everything from our computers to our politicians to our internet speeds, you name it. And, and after a while, we're six months into this pandemic. Do you ever feel like we're just kind of shuffling deck chairs around the Titanic? The ship is going down and we're messing with the little things? Pray for the big things. Pray for these things that, that Paul is praying for us. Paul's words to the Colossians should help us all. This is my prayer for you, to help us to refocus on what is ultimate in our lives. And it's Jesus Christ and the provision that God has made for us, where? In Him. His provision in Christ for us, the power of the hope of heaven. His simple plan for us as His people and His witnesses. How do we embrace that? By the choices we make. Are we asking for these blessings? Are we praying them for one another? And how do we do it? By remembering who we are and whose we are. By remembering what we have been given, faith, hope, and love. And by praying for and becoming what God wants for us. That's all part of His plan. Let's pray for that right now as we close. Praise team's going to come and we're going to sing, come to the altar just to remind us. We bring our lives, we lay them down, and we want what God wants. Let's pray right now. So, Father, I pray for everyone who's hearing my voice in this moment and those who will listen in days ahead. The simple truth of what you want for us that we would be filled with the knowledge of your will and that we would understand that will with all spiritual wisdom and understanding, not for our own gain, but that we might lead lives worthy, lead lives that are fully pleasing to you, O oh God, that we would bear fruit in every good work, that by the Holy Spirit you make us strong with the strength that comes from your glorious power. That God, again, in these troubled times, that you would help us to endure everything with patience, joyfully giving thanks to you, recognizing that no matter what we face, no matter what we endure, no matter how great our struggle, that you have rescued us from the power of darkness. And that in Jesus Christ, our Messiah, our beloved one, our Lord and Savior, in him we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you, God, for these gifts. This is our prayer. Help us to live it. This is who we are and who you have called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.